And welcome to the Hospice New Zealand Breakfast webinar held in partnership with Mobile Health. The presenter this month is Dr. Shirley Bush. Dr. Bush is an Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa and an investigator with both the Briere and the Ottawa Hospital Research Institutes. He has worked as a palliative care physician for over 25 years, having initially trained and worked as a GP in London. Dr. Bush is trained in palliative medicine in New Zealand and Australia, becoming a foundation fellow of the Australasian chapter of palliative medicine in 2000. She has worked as an attending physician on the palliative care unit at Bruyere Continuing Care in Ottawa since 2009. The topic today provides an overview of delirium in palliative care and also presents recent research on emerging medications for the prevention and management of delirium in preventive care populations. Also included in this presentation is adaptation and implementation of an interprofessional delirium clinical practice guideline on an inpatient palliative care unit to improve the quality of care. Right now to welcome Shirley. Thank you so much for that lovely um, the introduction and thank you very much for the um, invitation to come and present and welcome to everyone in your morning in New Zealand. It's the afternoon here in Ottawa. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders, past, present and future. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and I don't have any um, financial affiliations, I would like to mention that my presentation does include discussion of off-label use of medications, as currently there's no medication that has a license, an official license for delirium. I do also receive an Academic Protector Time Award from the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Peter Lawler, with whom I've been working here in Ottawa on delirium for coming on 10 years now. And as part of our collaboration, Peter Lawler set up SUNDIPS. This is studies to understand delirium palliative settings. And this was kicked off with a research planning meeting back in 2012 now. And we published a series of articles in a journal of pain and symptom management in 2014, if you're interested to look further about it. Subsequent to this, we um, developed <coughs> me, the Sunrise Collaboration. This is studies to understand and improve delirium care in palliative settings. So this is with the universities of Hull and York in the UK, the University of Ottawa and Carlton University here in Ottawa, and the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. I have um, been very fortunate to receive some funding from grants for some of the work I'm presenting today. So just let's talk about delirium. What is delirium? It's a neurocognitive disorder or syndrome due to global organic cerebral dysfunction. And it's important to remember that it's a clinical emergency. And it's really showing us that the patient has major underlying pathology, as well as destabilization in the homeostasis. If we think of the um, DSM criteria, this is a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. And the fifth edition came out in 2013. And the core criterion is criterion A, which is a disturbance in attention. So that's reduced ability to direct, focus or sustain and shift attention, and also reduce a disturbance in awareness. So maybe they're less orientated to the environment. Additional criterions are needed to meet the DSM criteria is that you have delirium developing over a short period of time, and it tends to fluctuate in severity during the course of the day, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. But you also do need an additional disturbance in cognition, such as memory deficit or perceptual deficit um, to meet the core criteria. Just trying to, I'm losing the top of my slides with uh, part of the Zoom, sorry. The, um, let's refer to this. This slide is showing the 
relationship between the etiological factors and delirium. So if we look on the left, what we probably were initially more familiar with is the metabolic changes that are happening that's impairing the cerebral metabolism of the brain. And this is leading to multiple neurotransmitters affecting their synthesis. But more recently, if you look on the right, we're actually becoming more familiar with other things that are happening affecting inflammation. So we're getting systemic inflammation, activation of primed microglia in the brain, and this is leading to increased cytokine levels in the brain. So all this is happening and causing neurotransmitter imbalance, and this is then leading to delirium. So on the left, I've listed a lot of common predisposing risk factors. Again, I'm sure you're very familiar with, with the most common being older age and having pre-existing dementia or cognitive impairment. So these are something that a person may have as a predisposing risk factor. And then they may have an additional precipitating factor that then triggers a delirium event. And I'm showing this, the image on the right because this is um, published by Shan Inwe, as it very nicely demonstrates the importance of how vulnerable your brain is. So if I'm thinking of a younger person who's got a very healthy brain, who has an accident and ends up in an intensive care unit, they need a very noxious insult or a very strong precipitating factor to precipitate a delirium episode. On the other hand, you've got a much older or frailer person, someone with advanced life-threatening illness, um, and they've got a very vulnerable brain, particularly if they've got dementia. You don't need much of a stimulus or precipitating factor to precipitate delirium. So if a patient's got a vulnerable brain, for whatever reason, that really puts them at much higher risk. And that includes if they've had delirium before, for example. So we know that delirium is complex. It's common in palliative care, and we still underdiagnose it. So if you see any change, sudden change in the patient's cognitive or physical function or the behavior suddenly seems to change, that really should trigger us to look further and at least you know, evaluate and at least exclude delirium, because I'd be highly suspicious that they may be developing delirium. Because we know one third of patients will have delirium when they're admitted to an inpatient palliative care unit. And in a recent systematic review um, that our group did, led by Christine Watt, across all palliative care settings, so that was inpatient as well as community and consult services, the prevalence of delirium in the last hours to days of life was 42 and up to 88%. So it really is a significant problem, increasing as you get closer to the end of life. Now, typically, we describe three sub clinical subtypes of delirium according to the degree of psychomotor activity. And I've used this image to kind of give you an idea of which is the most common subtype. So you can see here in palliative care patients, it's definitely the hypoactive subtype. So the patient's more lethargic, more withdrawn. Maybe it's misdiagnosed as depression or fatigue, be one of the differential diagnoses. On the other hand, if you think of the hyperactive, delirium where a patient's very agitated. Um, maybe that's the delirium subtype that's probably easier to pick up because it's more obvious. That affects about up to 25% of patients in palliative care settings. Um, maybe the patient presents as anxiety. They may in fact have akathisia. So these are things to exclude as well. In between, there's a category of mixed delirium where patients have a mixture of fluctuating hyperactive and hyperactive delirium features. Now, perceptual disturbances and delusions, although they're more common in the hyperactive or agitated delirium, they do also occur in patients who have hypoactive delirium. But we also know from David Marr's work that some patients have normal psycho psychomotor activity, and he um, called this the no motor subtype. So not everyone will show a difference in the psychomotor activity. Important thing to remember too. So this is a picture showing all those possible precipitating factors in delirium if you're a cancer patient. So you can see there's an awful lot of factors. Um, it's about the two o'clock position, very commonly the medications. And of course, we use a lot of these medications in palliative care, but varying from things affecting the brain, infection, 
organ failure, metabolic abnormalities. It's important if you find one cause for delirium episode to keep looking because we know that there can be a range from one to six delirium precipitates per episode with a median of three. So for example, a patient might have a combination of uh, urinary tract infection plus hypercalcemia plus dehydration. But we also, studies have shown in palliative care that about 50% of patients can improve if we are able to reverse any contributing factors. Obviously, this needs to be in keeping with their goals of care, um, that they're wanting to have um, more active management. Some precipitating factors will be more likely to be able to reverse, particularly medications such as opioids or benzodiazepines. I mentioned hypercalcemia before and infection. Whereas if it's a condition that's going to be more difficult to reverse, it'll be something like encephalopathy. So I know that patients has an encephalopathy, that delirium may well end up being more refractory. So I mentioned that delirium can resolve fully, but we're also becoming more aware that a lot of patients actually have persistent delirium. So it doesn't fully resolve. Delirium itself can cause long-term cognitive impairment. The patient already has dementia. Having a delirium superimposed on that can make their dementia itself worse. And we also obviously know that many patients have refractory delirium at the end of life. We think about the impact of delirium. Patients will have functional impairment and decline, leading to more falls. The healthcare costs go up because they're spending longer times in hospital. And the significant psychological distress for both patients, families, as well as the healthcare providers. So let's think about the patient who's experiencing a delirium. As I said, it's very distressing for patients. And in these studies, over half to three quarters of the patients did recall their delirium if it resolved. And it was also in the study, patients have significant distress. And it wasn't just the hyperactive delirium, it was also for the hypoactive delirium. And it was as if that they had they kind of lost what happened for a day or two. And that actually made them very distressed because they had no idea what they had done in that time. So what can we do to help better support the patients and the families? This is the NICE guideline, so the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. I'm showing you the cover here because it's a very, very long guideline. It's published, the original version was published in 2010, but they do update it every couple of years at a minimum, but have noted excluded patients at the end of life. However, they did say delirium can be prevented in about a third of patients, which is hugely, hugely significant. And the way this was done was using non-pharmacological interventions led by this seminal work by Shan Inouye back in 1999. So she used a multi-component non-pharmacological intervention to prevent delirium in older patients. And this is just to remind us what these would look like. So particularly orientation, um, mobilizing the patient as much as possible, making sure we, they've got their devices to help with hearing and vision, doing what we can do to do to preserve the sleep-wake cycle, to minimize the disruptions to sleep, et cetera, and making sure they're well hydrated. And then, Mira Agos study with my colleague, he was second author, Dr. Peter Lawler, published, it was originally in December, 2016, this study that I really feel turns the palliative care world upside down because they looked at, there's a randomized controlled trial that really made us question our practice, like what, how are we best going to manage our patients? So for those who may be not so familiar with the study, I just did a few slides, just as a synopsis. So this was a randomized controlled trial of oral risperidone or oral haloperidol or oral placebo over 72 hours. It was an Australian multi-site, double-blind, parallel arm, dose-titrated randomized controlled trial. 
And they were adult patients who were all inpatients in a hospice or in a palliative care setting who had a confirmed delirium diagnosis. So for the antipsychotic dose, this was risperidone or haloperidol, they age adjusted it. So if, if you were younger, so under 60, 65 or under, it was a 0.5 milligram dose um, and then titrated accordingly, up to a maximum of four milligrams would be reached after 72 hours. But for older patients over the age of 65, they used half the loading dose. So it's just 0.25 milligrams. Patients were able to receive a rescue dose of midazolam of 2.5 milligrams subcutaneously, although this dosing was not age adjusted. So it's a very large study. They had 247 patients, predominantly male, just 66%, with a mean age of about 75 years, and the majority had cancer. Now, they had a baseline Australia modified colonoscopy of 30 to 50%. And I printed a copy off because it's not a tool I use here. Um, so 30% that's similar to my PPS here. So almost completely bedfast. And the 50% requires considerable assistance and frequent medical care. Patients had mild to moderate delirium severity. So this was measure, uh, measured by the Memorial Delirium Assessment Scale. I've included the study flow diagram here. Um, sorry, I can't quite see the top of my slide here, but I'll put my printout here. Like they assess, can you see the top of the slide there? It was over 1,800 yeah, um, patients to end up with 249 randomized. This study took them a very long time to do, to complete. Um, so great kudos to them to getting to the end. Um, and of note, more patients actually discontinued the risperidone regimen, particularly because patient, more patients seem to deteriorate in that group. They assessed delirium symptoms by using the new desk tool. This is the nursing delirium screening scale. Um, it actually has five items and they just use the middle three items. So item two, which looked at inappropriate behavior, Item three, which was communication. Item four, illusions and hallucinations. And the slide on the right shows that for the risperidone group, the little orange dots, and the haloperidol group, the little blue dots, they had worse, higher delirium symptom scores, so more delirium symptoms than those who received placebo. All right, so you had more delirium symptoms on the antipsychotics. Um, they also found that if people, those participants who received the placebo medication, they had less rescue midazolam used as well. And then when they looked at the survival, they found that the patients who received the antipsychotics had shorter survival. You see placebo arm 26 days compared to risperidone haloperidol 17 and 16 days respectively. And in the post hoc analysis, they summarized that as participants who received the antipsychotics were approximately 1.5 times more likely to die. So this kind of, as I said, put a thumbs down to antipsychotics. But I do say these are patients who had mild to moderate severity delirium. So are these results, can I generalize to a patient who has more severe delirium? Can I generalize the results to have someone who has, had, who has worse performance status? Shortly after, um, uh, Mira with David Marr uh, published a debate article that I refer to you if you for, for more interest. Is uh, David Marr was still saying, well, maybe don't throw the antipsychotics out with the bathwater. They may still have a limited role. So I thought that was a very interesting paper. Having said that, many other papers, and I've only just put up one example of a systematic review here that's looking at the benefits and harms of antipsychotics in adults, saying that current evidence does not support the routine use of these medications to treat delirium in adult inpatients. By taking all that in the background, I, I was the lead for the um, European Society for Medical Oncology Delirium Guideline. So I had to synthesize this and I took more of a pragmatic 
pragmatic approach and produced a practice point um, in alignment with a lot of what a lot of the guidelines were doing at the time, just saying that we should limit the use of our pharmacological interventions such as anti antipsychotics, maybe just use them if a patient is really distressed by their delirium symptoms, so they've got really distressing hallucinations, say, or if there's safety concerns, if the patients are risk themselves or others. And then we should also remember that we should use the lowest dose possible and for the shortest period of time as possible. And I was also tasked with um, developing a delirium guideline for our unit. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time talking about that. So again, that was the background piece, looking at the non-pharmacological um, interventions and changing practice with antipsychotic practice and use. So the aim for this guideline was we were wanting to improve um, our detection of delirium and also improving our care of delirious patients and their families. And we also, the uh, management team also identified a need that we need to improve our communication. This was not just with patients and families, but also with other team members as well. So I used this as an opportunity to incorporate that recent trial evidence from Mira's study. So I first adapted and implemented the guideline. And what was important for this was it was interprofessional. So it's intended that everyone completed um, at least most, you know, some of the modules. So this wasn't just the nurses and the physicians and the pharmacists. This extended out to allied health, to the volunteers, to the ward clerks and the porter. So everyone had to have a learn something about delirium. And it was broken down into modules to make it easier for implementation. The first step was I had to go and find some guidelines that I thought would be good to, to, to use. So I actually had to do a quality assessment first. And this was done using the Agree To tool, which is the appraisal of guidelines for research and evaluation. So in an ideal world, you find one that meets your needs and you just take it off the shelf and implement it. But I couldn't find a suitable one. So I selected four um, high quality guidelines that seemed applicable to our population to adapt. We had a little core interprofessional interprofessional group, an adaptation group. And then I set about developing a delirium care pathway. That was page two, two. So there were two pages that looked like that. And I thought, well, there's no way I can implement this. And then I reflected on what about all these other symptoms in palliative care, such as pain, constipation? Like, is there a way I can kind of fashion or get a template for this guideline that I could also use in future for other symptom management guidelines? So there's more familiarity with the structure and content. And I came up with this. So the silver box at the top, that, that represents what I call the starter kit. This was to provide kind of really fundamental knowledge on delirium, but also to orientate the learner to what the other modules were that, um, that would need to be completed. The communication support, because that was so important, that was like an overall, overall kind of overall arch theme for the whole guideline. And then you can see the broken color-coded modules that um, it was all broken down into. So the Agree To tool that I'd used before only looks at guideline quality. It doesn't actually tell me what about the contents actually in the guideline, what do they actually say. So to do this, I had to complete a content analysis. And I'd never done this before. So you actually had to think of what key questions you want to ask, like what answers do I want to know from these guidelines? And this is done by developing a recommendations matrix. So if you're not familiar with this, because this is the first time I'd done this, this is what one might look like. So I literally lined up some guidelines back to back here. You can see that I've got the NICE guideline, the Canadian Society for Seniors in Mental Health, um, what they're agreed to, rigor tool, Bigger scores. And for example, in the blue, my health question, my first one was what are the recommendations for the management of polypharmacy and deprescribing? I went through with all my health questions through all the guidelines I was looking at. From that, we drafted and finalized the guideline with help from the inter interprofessional group. And then we had to implement the modules. I also created a big picture summary, which is a two-page laminated sheet that could be put in the front of all the 
drug charts. We call them here medical medication administration records. So it's just an easy point of care reference tool, as well as then evaluating. Throughout this process, I used a CAN implement. This is a Canadian resource, which is for guideline adaptation and implementation and planning. I really liked it. It was really helpful that they said, think implementation right from the start. So you'd actually think, rather than just creating content and then getting to the finish line and think, how am I going to implement it? It really made you fashion your content in such a way that it was ready to implement at the end. And it truly was an iterative approach. How do we do it? I'm sure there's many in the audience who have implemented guidelines before. It's a lot of work. Um, we had multiple um, small group sessions, so they last for 45 minutes. So this, as I said, was for everyone in the team. It took two weeks. There were face-to-face -face facilitated sessions for the starter kit. Um, the nurses stayed for another 15 minutes for the monitoring um, small module. And then we developed four online self-learning self, sorry, four online self-learning modules, um, which were completed according to the role. So for the screening, which was the nursing delirium screening scale, that was just for nurses. It was optional. If you wanted to complete it, you could, but just nurses were mandated to complete that. Um, the non-pharmacological and the, how to communicate with the delirious patient, that was for everyone in the team. And then there was a, quite a large pharmacological module for the nurses, physicians, and the pharmacist. We also completed a bilingual, so English and French here, delirium patient and family information leaflet. I haven't got time to describe the process of implementation, but I thought maybe a board game such as Snakes and Ladders gives you an idea. Just when you think you're getting to the top of the ladder, you start slipping down a snake. So for the starter kit, as I said, that everyone had to attend that. So that was 100% completion. And the completion rate for the online modules was 80.4%. We did do an online survey with a 32% response rate and 10 participants for focus groups and interviews. We looked at 20 charts before the guideline was implemented and another 20 after the guideline was implemented. And just to give you a flavor, if you like, of the results, I've just shown, shown some from the SMART model of clinical utility. And staff did um, agree that it was appropriate, accessible, and practicable. We used an iterative thematic analysis for the focus groups and interviews. And we found these six key themes, looking at the importance of prior delirium knowledge or experience, the importance of guidelines and the useful elements within them, the importance of the collaborative effort of change, but also the challenges in facilitating change, and finally, the impacts on the practice after implementation of the guideline. So for the chart order, I've just focused here on looking at administration of the antipsychotics and benzodiazepines. So we looked at 24 hours before someone had a delirium diagnosis in the chart, and 48 hours after the delirium diagnosis. Um, and I should have mentioned, also mentioned that this time it was a blended. Um, we had by then, because this also impacted our implementation, um, developed the electronic medical record had come into being, but all the medications were still on paper, um, Mars. So it's a combined paper and electronic medical record ordered. After the guideline was implemented, we found about 60% less scheduled antipsychotic use. There's similar PRN or as needed antipsychotic use, but an there was a big increase, 50% increase in subcutaneous midazolam admi administration, so as needed. But I was very pleased to see that there was, I could see nursing documentation after the guideline was implemented that they were really trying quite hard to try their non pharmacological interventions and clearly documenting that. Sometimes that on its own worked, and if not, they said they tried them, it didn't work, and then they needed the medication um, with effect to settle the patient. So as we know, implementing a guideline it needs a lot of effort, a lot of time, and definitely need management support. 
And this modular approach was really facilitated by the team support from the interprofessional team. If anyone's interested, the Delirium Information Leaflet is available. Um, I, the organization's put it up on our um, external website, so it's available for download. Um, so the links are there. Or else you can just go to brea.org and just type Delirium in the search window and you'll find the link there. I'm just having a little sip of water here before I go into the last bit. Right, so I've just got a little bit more before we come into questions at the end. I just wanted to talk about a couple of emerging medications that have been used for the prevention and management of delirium. So this would be melatonin and dexamethamidine. This is a picture of a melatonin, and Dracula is here to remind me it's a neurohormone that comes out at night. Because it's produced, melatonin is produced by the pineal gland and controls the sleep wake cycle and our circadian rhythms. And our own endogenous melatonin levels start to rise at 10 o'clock at night, peak around 3 a.m. And I'm sorry for everyone online there in New Zealand, you're beginning to drop down to your usual low time, low daytime level. All right, because it drops down to that by nine o'clock in the morning. But we also know that the sleep-wake cycle disturbance has been reported in a significant number of cancer patients with delirium, 75 to 100%. But also if we look at the, one of the mechanisms in delirium pathogenesis, melatonin dysregulation has been postulated as one of these mechanisms. So this was of interest to us here, particularly when we saw a couple of these non-pharma-sponsored trials on melatonin, particularly the top one by Al Armour in 2011, which was from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. So this was on internal medicine inpatients who were over the age of 65, with a final number of 122 included. They used a low physiologic dose of melatonin, 0.5 milligrams, or placebo, because it was a randomized controlled trial. And there was a lower risk of delirium in the melatonin group, 12 versus 31%. We thought, well, is this something we ought to think about for palliative care patients? This paper was being published. It is available open access if you're interested to read more. But I should point out it is a feasibility study. So it's really to test out trial procedures um, for a randomized controlled trial with the aim of um, making sure they're going to be suitable for a larger randomized controlled trial. There's a synopsis for this study. This was a parallel arm, double-blind randomized controlled trial here in our inpatient unit, Elizabeth Rare Hospital. There were adult inpatients who did not have delirium, but they had advanced cancer, and they had to have a palliative performance score of 30% or more. So 30% is when someone's bedbound, and then above that, people are more mobile. If you're not familiar with the PPS, when you drop to 20%, that's when your oral intake significantly reduces, and 10%, you're taking nothing by mouth. So for our sample size estimations for this for our feasibility study, we ended up with 60 participants, so 30 participants in each arm. And our primary outcome was time in days to incident delirium. One of the challenges was we had to get informed consent within 72 hours of admission. A lot of patients already had delirium when they were admitted. And we also found it's um, quite an emotive time when patients just been admitted to start talking about a study. So some patients, it was just too overwhelming to think about uh, participating in the study. Our pharmacological intervention was an immediate release melatonin we have available here and or identical placebo given by mouth at nine o'clock at night every day. And patients were continued on this medication until day 28 um, or stopped it if they developed delirium, they died, were discharged or withdrew from the study. This took a long time, 16 months. So we screened 616 participants or subjects, sorry, to get 60 participants. Um, 
So this is pretty standard. A lot of palliative care um, studies show about 10% um, will rec your recruit from screening. So for our study outcomes, but just remember, this is a feasibility study. We're not powered really to show the outcomes, but the melatonin is in blue. And out of 30 participants, 11 developed delirium if they had melatonin versus 10 who received placebo. And also with a survival analysis, it was shorter in the patients who received melatonin. But what was important for our feasibility study was there were no serious trial medication related adverse effects. And the core study procedures were acceptable to, uh, to all the patients, the family and the staff. We haven't embarked yet on a bigger randomized controlled trial because we're waiting. We're part of the group with Miri Agar in Australia. This is the registration page. They've just finished recruiting a few months ago for a study looking at melatonin, a phase three trial using prolonged release melatonin, and they've recruited 220 participants. So we await those results eagerly. I'd just like to touch on dexmetomidine. Now, this picture is taking a slide from a paper in 2009, and it's quite striking. When dexmetomidine was used in critically ill patients, the difference and the level, the reduction in delirium prevalence as opposed to the usual agent they used to use, midazolam. Dexmetomidine is an interesting medication. It's centrally active, highly selective, and it's an agonist on the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. But it has both sedative and analgesic properties. But what's interesting, it produces what's called arousable or cooperative sedation. And so it's been used for many years now in critically ill patients for agitated delirium with really quite good effects. It had been initially quite expensive. Um, but now it's off patent. It's become something that's maybe more something that we can consider. There have previously been case series published in palliative care patients. And here another advantage, it can be given as a continuous subcutaneous infusion. So that's good, something good, again, for our patient population. And this team, led by Gen Benjamin Thomas in Australia, just published in Palliative Medicine, the open label pilot study on dexmetomidine. So I thought I'd just do a brief synopsis of that. So it said it's an Australian study, single site, an open label single arm pilot study. So again, adult patients in a palliative care unit who had hyperactive or agitated delirium at the end of life. Now they had moderate to severe delirium as measured by the Memorial Delirium Assessment Scale. And they also were getting close to the end of life with a condition predicted survival of seven days or less. So the intervention was dexmetomidine as a continuous subcutaneous infusion. And they described it as low or high dose, with the low dose being the tier one dosing, so 0 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per hour, and the high dose being the tier two dosing, 0 0.6 micrograms per kilogram per hour. They had 22 patients in their sample. They measured delirium severity on the MDAS, that's Memorial Delirium Assessment Scale. And they looked at the level of rousability. And this was the palliative version of the Richmond Adaptation Sedation Scale. So minus one to minus three. So that's if the patient's a bit drowsy to moderately sedated. They also were also interested in seeing how much opioids were being used for pain as well. I just included one figure here, just to give you an idea, they were aiming for a RAS power level of minus one to minus three. And the green is the lower dose, the tier one. And you can just see over the days how the patient became more sedated um, compared to the kind of purpley color in the middle, the tier two. So the mean age of their patients was 72 and a half years. Out of the 22 patients, nine stayed on tier one. 60% escalated to the higher dosing tier two between day one and day five. Thinking about how long they were on the study, there was a median of 72.5 hours, but that range went right up to 222 hours. And the rescue dose of midazolam, sorry, rescue use of midazolam was variable. Now remember it's given subcutaneous infusion and there's only one observed site reaction 
of some localized bruising out of 113 assessments. So it really does look like it's pretty well tolerated subcutaneously. And I was interested in the, I put a bit of a little mini snippet of the study flow diagram on the right, because otherwise you wouldn't read it. Um, that 10 actually crossed over to standard care. And what I found interested was interesting was like five of those was both either the patient or the family wanted to be more sleepy. So there you are promoting dexmetomidine as being rousable sedation. And it seems appealing because maybe it means patients toward the end of life can have more meaningful interaction with their family. But some patients and family were saying, no, I want to be more sedated. So that's interesting and needs more, more study and probably some qualitative work. Our group here in Ottawa, um, this is the page from the clinicaltrials.gov page. We're about to um, get our health candidate approval and launch our open label single arm study on dexmetomidine, but it's a multi-center study. More work in progress, and I'm sure other groups are doing some more work as well. So where do we go to from here? I was expecting you to read this. Delirium is super complicated. This is <clears throat> just sorry, gives you an idea of delirium pathophysiology um, as depicted by Jose Maldonado. Super complicated. There's still an awful lot more we don't really understand about delirium and we have to learn. So as we said, delirium is complex and it's probably that we need multifaceted interventions. So just expecting one medication to suit all types of delirium and all types of precipitating factors is very unlikely. We probably need to tailor our treatments depending on the, the subtype and maybe the underlying cause. I was part of the group here with Anne-Marie Jose in Sydney, who recently published her multi-component non-pharmacological intervention for, uh, in delirium for hospice patients and palliative care patients with advanced cancer. This is very limited work in our patient population. But we still do need more studies to look at this to see really how effective is it in palliative care and how best can we actually provide these interventions and tailor them to our patients. David Huey and the team at MD Anderson published their study on lorazepam and haloperidol. Now, these patients um, were much sicker, much closer to the end of life and had much uh, more severe delirium as well. But we do still need more research on the role of antipsychotics and benzodiazepines across the illness trajectory in a palliative care patient. So particularly as we get closer towards the end of life. And we also do need more research on delirium related distress and how best to help support people. Just leave you with a couple of resources. The first paper was an open is available open access. Um, I've included that because the detailed appendix that you can also download separately is very close to what we're using in our palliative care unit as part of our guideline. So I was kind of writing this paper as I was writing my guideline. And I'd also really recommend this video. So it's freely available by European Delirium Association. It's a five minute video where there's a retired teacher who experienced delirium in intensive care, and he's talking about his experience six months after the episode. And you can actually see how vivid it still is and how distressing it was still to him six months after the episode. I'd like to acknowledge all these people here listed here that I've worked with over my years here in Ottawa. So thank you very much for your attention. Shame I can't be there in person because that would be even better, but never mind. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shirley. And we open it to questions. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, I'm going to read them out to you now. Uh, the first question comes from Kathy West. Would you be willing to share your delirium guideline? It would be a wonderful uh, resource, especially for those new to palliative care. Uh, great question. <laughs> I can't actually share it just at the moment. Um, because I haven't, when I developed it, put it this way, I wasn't thinking about making it freely accessible. So we need to go through and change all the images to make them freely accessible. Because um, obviously there's a different um, accessibility if you're just using it for teaching as opposed to whether it's open access. Um, and I think I need, it needs a bit of tweaking. So I said, I've made the Delirium leaflet available. I recommend the 
delirium guideline, the de sorry, the drugs paper is close to what we did in the delirium guideline to give you an idea. Um, and I have just submitted um, my publication like two weeks ago <laughs> on all this work to a journal. So fingers crossed, <laughs> then you might be able to read a bit more. Um, and that'll give you some more ideas. The one other thing, if you're interested, it's not really part of the delirium guideline, but I was thinking a bit more ahead about making things more open access. The, we have developed a module on learning the RASPAL, how to implement the RASPAL tool and assess patients with it. So that's the palliative version of the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. So if you go to the same um, website link for the information leaflet or go to briere.org and search for delirium, at the very bottom of the page, um, it says for refractory delirium, there's actually a link and you, actually, you can actually do the RASPAL module. So that, that bit of it, that like a later part of it, I have made uh, available. So sorry, not the whole thing just yet. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just making sure that this is covered in what you've just said. What about access to those modules? Is, was that included in your previous answer? Um, yes. That, that's a different thing. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I'm sorry, I haven't got available and I need to retool. And at the moment, I'm working on the participation guideline first and then maybe I'll get back to the delirium guideline. Well, people yeah. will be looking forward to it. Um, what are the, the other thing, if I can just mention, is what was critical rather than me just giving out the modules, what I really learned in this work was the importance of your local context and culture. Just taking something and just implementing it, I actually don't think will work. The actual process of looking at a guideline and working out what do we need in our site, what's going to answer our needs, what can we implement, what have we got the staff to implement, um, what resources do we have, is actually a very important factor. Thank you. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, what are the reasons for the worst outcomes with risperidone and haloperidol versus the placebo? It's a great question. We don't know. Um, and I also don't know, is it just those two drugs? Um, does it also affect, we call it methyltrimepresine here, and you call it levomepreprazine, levomepromazine, I think still in New Zealand, um, or nozinan. Um, that wasn't studied. Like, I don't know if it's all antipsychotic. So this is why we need more um, studies, really, just to show. Uh, there's a question here. What slide was it that showed the purple strongly disagree, which was overwhelmingly the highest statistic? Somebody wants to <laughs> see one of your slides again. Do you know it is, and it's is? tiny, tiny print. I might have to go back to my slides because I, <laughs> I put my glasses on, but I can't see my... Um, so excuse me. That must be the one, yes. So the accessible bit, which is lots of purple, was I know where to find, I know where to go on the palliative care unit to find out about the guideline. And the other one, the blocks of the palliative care unit specific to my professional are within my areas of expertise. The, the palliative care unit guideline is easy to learn. And the palliative care unit delirium guideline is a good educational tool. Well, thanks for that. That's much clearer. And the other um, one that was more red um, was there was they were disagreeing that was not sufficient time to follow the guideline. Right. Question here: Can you mix the dexamethadine uh, with other medication? Yeah, sorry, with other medication in the syringe driver. Uh, I'm not a pharmacist <laughs> to actually know what would happen, but we're not mixing it. We've um, our team here. It have actually been led by Sal Kanji. They recently did um, a stability study looking at the stability of dexmatomidine. Um, so this is on its own, and it seems to be fairly stable because we pre-mix um, our medications into little cassettes here, as opposed to making it up in each day into a syringe driver. Uh, we lost our syringe drivers. Oh, yeah, this was the a week before I arrived here. They got rid of syringe drivers, so I had to learn about CADs. <laughs> it's a very different way of using things. So our dexmatomidine will be mixed in a pre-loaded cassette. And the other reason I wouldn't want to mix it with other medications, because the way we're going to use it, we're going to titrate the dose. So you can change it up to every hour. So we might start at 0 0.2 micrograms per hour and then change it to 0 0.3 micrograms per hour. So you don't want any other medications in there. You just want it just separate. Yeah. Thank you. But as, as to if it goes cloudy or green, I would not know. But I, I suggest just keeping it separate because you'll want to titrate it on its own. Thanks. A lot of the research seems to be with cancer patients. How applicable is the current evidence to non-cancer palliative care patients? 
That's a great question, Wayne. It's um, I think we just have to go by extrapolation to see if, if, that it probably is the same across all groups. I think, though, if you think about the non-cancer patients, a lot of them are older patients. I'm seeing a lot older patients with dementia and frailty. And so really that's already been covered in geriatric or literature for older people. And they've been saying for a long time that Sharon Inouye's work, that antipsychotics are really bad for these people. Okay, the longer they're on them, we know it can actually increase the risk of having TIAs and strokes, causes increased mortality. So in, in the older frail patients with a lot of comorbidities, these medications are harmful. And as such, in our guideline, I, we particularly said if a patient was very old or very frail, rather than using haloperidol 0.5 as a potential starting dose, we go down to 0.25. So we really come down very small. So we really have significantly dropped our dosing um, of antipsychotics. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> have you routinely incorporated delirium prevention measures on your PCU or into the delirium guideline? That's Vicky. Yes. We try to, but we need a refresh, I think, with the right description um, because it hasn't been standardized. So that's my next project. Yeah. And I think um, the non farm module, if you looked at Anne Marie Hosey's study in Journal of Part of Medicine, that tells you a bit more how she was doing it um, in Australia as well. Um, now, the next question is um, you mentioned non pharmacological interventions nurses use. What were they? So it's the things about the non-pharmacological is um, when you go in to see a patient, even if you've just been in the room, just to remind them who you are, um, who they are, where you are. So it's really the orientation, um, making sure they've got, they're adequately hydrated, um, looking at the medication chart, de-prescribed. So all those things that I had in that table as well, making sure they've got, the, they've got their vision aids and hearing aids. Um, trying to make sure it's dark, it's dark at night and not too, not too noisy, all those kind of things. But we do need to look at, um, and that's what anne study was, that some are easier to implement in palliative care settings than others. Um, I was quite struck when it was a few years ago at a conference that they were showing us what they're doing in intensive care unit. The mobility is so important. They were getting them out of bed, still with a trach, and about six people around them walking down the intensive care unit. Um, so obviously our, our patients have much less mobility, so we are going to have to adapt um, to, to our patients and also to see what's acceptable to them. So I said Anne-Marie's study is a great start, um, but we do need to do more work on that area, and I'm beginning to think about how I can um, help the nurses doing it in a more systematic fashion. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the communication with delirium patients? Uh, do you connect with them in their delirium? Yeah, brilliant. I liken it, the, um, the tips is really just to consider what patients have said, what it's like when they're in a delirium, and they describe it as being in a fog. So I liken it to um, the vision, like old-fashioned cameras before you had your smartphones, we used to have to focus, so things are going in and out of focus. And the same happening with the hearing. Sometimes they hear you clearly, and sometimes it's going in and out of focus, like the old-fashioned radio tuning um, knob as well. So you have to speak very, face them, okay? Um, and just talk, talk very simply, very short, simple sentences. You may have to repeat it. it has to be very concrete. So those are the kind of tips that we're, we're sharing with people. And if they're getting very agitated, try and distract them as, as well. But they really do need a lot of reassurance um, because a patient's agitated, they're not meaning to be. They are absolutely terrified they're probably terrified that you're trying to kill them. They've probably just forgotten you're the nurse. Oh, gosh. All right. And it strikes there was um, a paper in the British Journal of Psychiatry by a retired um, psychiatry professor who had delirium. And this is a guy who'd known delirium. So it wasn't until he recovered, he realized the nurse wasn't trying to give him poison gas. That was just his oxygen mask. They weren't trying to kill him with something on his arm. That was them just trying to take his blood pressure. And this is a doctor who'd know all, what all these things are. So what would a patient imagine? And unfortunately, nurses are the ones that the patients particularly pull into their 
patterns of disorientation and perceptual disturbance. And very much they feel very threatened that the nurse, someone's trying to kill them. So you have to be very calm and reassuring and explain carefully what you're doing. Because yes, you might have given them injection every day, but suddenly they think, oh, they've just tried to kill me. So just really calmly and reassure them every time. Thank you Hopefully very much. that helps. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We've got just a few more minutes, so I'm going to pick a few more questions. Um, how do you see your approach uh, being used in the community at home? Using um, how do you, using do you it, see it, the guideline? Problem, do you see any problem using it in the community at home? I imagine I'm not quite sure what it is. I imagine the guideline the, or the whole approach. Yeah, the guideline. Oh, the whole approach. No, we actually, for the delirium information leaflet, I reworded it and took the word part of care unit off so they could use it in the uh, um, community for our patients as well. So anyone within our organisation can access um, the modules. But as I said, it's unfortunately just in the right. um, organisation. Someone has said, can you please share the link for the video with the gentleman who experienced delir delirium? So that was there. So if you go to, if you um, look up, European Delirium Association, and then you'll find a link for a patient video. And can you show the link? For the pamphlet? Can you show the link for the pamphlet again? Oh, please? I can. So as I said, that's the long version. But if you just go to Breer, b r u y e r e dot org, and then just put delirium in the search window, um, then you'll you'll find it. So it's about the second link down. Another question is: Do you have any experience with clonidine alpha two and agonist as dexmedetomidine? Okay. No. Do you? <laughs> I'd be interested to hear if you do. Okay. No, no comment there. Maybe somebody will write a comment. Um, and um, since, distress from, yeah. since distress from patient and a family aggravate delirium, could you talk more about the tools and research in this area as a way to manage delirium? That might be rather a long one for you to answer at this stage. Yeah. The it's still a work in progress, and I'm Mira. Um, so Anne Marie is about is submitting a research study to look into, into this a bit more. The the main the initial study for our patient population was by Bill Breitbart. So they and Eduardo did afterwards. They used a the delirium experience questionnaire, and uh, Eduardo also did some qualitative work. So this is this is an area that we do need to do more work. I think. Cool. Yeah. So it's really just to help how we can support it. Yeah. Um, somebody wants to know why you got rid of the, the uh, syringe drivers. Please elaborate. I didn't get rid of them. It came through that it was deemed that they were not safe because they're old technology. And so they made a decision rather than phasing them out here, they just decided just they were just going to get, get rid of them on this particular day. Yeah. And um, Kay says, we're currently involved in the NZ Preserve Non-Pharmacological Prevention. Yeah, I'm, also, I'm also one on that as well, yeah. Um, she says, we're finding that involvement with families and prevention strategies might be one of the most important interventions. So she's really making a comment rather than asking her. Yeah, question. and I completely agree, Kay. The, um, the pamphlet, we don't just give it out to families. Like I use it, I describe delirium. It's really more supportive um, piece. It's not just, oh, here's the pamphlet. It's uh, really, I describe it. This is what I want you to do to the patient. I model very much how I talk to the patient so they can see what I mean. Um, but the leaflet very much has the tips on how to what they can do to help um, support the the patient who's got delirium, and also how they can communicate. So the people who asked before just remembered if you asked about like the tips how to communicate with the patient. If you look at the leaflet, I've also summarised them there as well. Cool. Yeah. Just a clarification that one about um, um, applying the uh, the guidelines at home. Actually, what oh. this meant was. Dexmatomidine. Yes. I think we, yeah, I think we have to wait and see because we need to see these studies because it's going to be unmonitored. So normally it's, it's not, you know, this is something new because obviously in critical care it's monitored all the time. Yeah. Um, and I also don't know the availability of the medication, you know, mi mixing mixing the drugs and that kind of thing. And also you also will have to factor up the cost. Yeah. And um, and I think it's also going to be for people with really quite resistant delirium, in which case maybe they've ended up being admitted anyway. Yeah, so. And someone else is saying, um, Kia ora, I see your neighbours, John Hopkins University, have been looking at psychedelics such as 
Oh, psilocybin in the psilocybin. treatment of end-of-life end of life patients. Have you heard any discussion around these in Canada? Yeah, we're trying to do a study here as well on that. Some other people have been doing that in Canada. So it's not really specific to delirium, but more existential um, distress as well. Right. Yeah. And either having <laughs> microdosing or having larger dosing and guided therapy. But that's very intensive. You need a therapist with you like the whole day. Or two therapists because they need to take a break. Yeah. Any but again, another area of great interest, yeah, that's coming through. Any particular other articles about the non-pharmacological approaches that you would like to recommend? I'd look up um, Mira's study. Sorry, Mira, well, I'm Mira's the last author. So Anne-Marie Hosey in the Journal of Patent Medicine. Shan Sharon Inway's team, if you look up Sharon Inway on PubMed, like they've done a lot, awful lot on... Um, this work but again it was guy it was particularly for aged older patients so they brought up what was called the help program so this was hospital elder life program um, and they do also they've moved recently though so if you look up at the help program h-e-l-p program for older patients with delirium um, i'm just trying to think it's just gone um, they've also got uh, another website I think I've changed, I can't remember it. They've changed, it used to be Help Older Life, but they actually changed the name of the website and I just can't remember what the website name is at the moment. Um, yeah. Thank you. So sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure if you look up Sharon Inway and um, the help for delirium for older adults, you should be able to see it. But my, um, I put, should I put my last slide up because I've got my, or did you put it in the chat? My um, email address, send you the, there we are. There we are. So there we are. There we go. Of, please take a note. That's probably the best way. The, yeah. That's a really generous offer. Thank you. So it's time to call the uh, webinar to a close. Thank you so much. All that remains is to me to say thank you, Shirley, for your presentation today. Um, and thank you to all the participants for taking part in our webinar. Thank you so much because you all got up very early in the morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Off to work now. Thank you again. And uh, I'll close the meeting now. And take care, all of you, and stay safe.